For today's program, we are very pleased to have Johan Neem and all of our other guests joining us today. Dr. Neem is the author of a new book called What's the Point of College? And it's just come out this fall. His other written works include Democracy's Schools, The Rise of Public Education in America, and pieces published in the Washington Post, USA Today, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The Seattle Times, and Inside Higher Education. Dr. Neem has been interviewed on education for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and in a feature for the PBS NewsHour. I think with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Dr. Neem. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm going to introduce the two other guests, and then we're just going to jump right into it. Our topic today is misinformation, um, and that doesn't mean we're advocating it. That doesn't mean that we're trying to provide it, although one often happens into it from time to time. Um, so my two guests are Michael Artime, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Pacific Lutheran University. He is interested in the intersections between new media and political behavior, voting and elections, and the institutions of American government. And he lives in Tacoma. So thank you for driving up. Definitely. And some of you may know Ira Hyman because he is a local, um, is a professor of psychology at Western Washington University. And he has conducted research on how people create false memories. Much of his research has investigated how people adopt misinformation. So I think that'll be relevant today. He's a regular contributor to the Psychology Today website, writing about the application of basic cognitive research to everyday institutions. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Hello. Oh, there we go. All right. We Thanks. figured that out. Um, no karaoke, but <laughs> what I do want to do is I thought I'd start by just asking you both briefly to describe the nature of your research and how that helps us think about the question of the day, which is misinformation in American politics. We're not doing a dissertation defense, so, you know, a kind of the briefer version, yeah. But, um, but I would love to hear how your work informs what we're talking about today. Yeah, so um, I, I study, uh, you know, media and politics in particular. Uh, my research has been in the area of um, looking at internet comment sections and the types of things that are said uh, on those forums. So people are incredibly nice to each other there, as you all <laughs> might know. Um, and so I, I've been interested in places that people are having political conversations that we don't really evaluate fully, that a lot of people are exposed um, to this type of material, and we don't, other than just sort of having a general sense that what is happening there is not good, we don't fully know the types of conversations that are going on there. And I can tell you that it, it, does, it does confirm our expectations that uh, it is pretty bad. And so, um, you know, in these spaces, it, you know, as, as you read uh, the comments, it becomes really, you know, really easy to see how misinformation um, can spread and how willing people are to believe things that aren't true if those things confirm um, their existing um, political beliefs. And so, um, so that's how I kind of enter into this conversation. Thanks. So as a cognitive psychologist, I study topics related to attention and memory and judgment and decision making. And as Johan noted, a lot of my work is focused on how people adopt information from other people and other sources. Uh, whether that information is true or false uh, doesn't seem to matter so much, but we do tend to adopt a lot of information. Um, and in my field, a lot of people also worry about how people make judgments about what, whether or not something is true. And it's really oftentimes not based on whether or not it's true, but there are a lot of factors that contribute to that. Um, in addition, when we talk about judgment and decision making, there's sort of an assumption that people are 
thoughtful, careful, judicious reasoners about information, <laughs> or at least we have this hopeful belief that we are critical consumers of information when we encounter it in the world, whereas most of us who are cognitive psychologists know that that's just frankly not the case. Um, and so I worry about the spread of misinformation because of what I know about how people make judgments um, and how people accept information and how willing they are to accept that information. Thank you. So we have a cognitive psychologist, a political scientist. Unfortunately, you also have a historian. And one of the things that means is that my, I sort of stopped knowing things on or about 1840. But what I do know <laughs> is that the period I studied, which is the early US, and the sort of emergence of American democracy, I mean, reading the newspapers of that time would make you blush. You know, the, the partisanship, the, the, you know, these, this is the emergence of a cheap mass print culture, um, the ways in which the Federalist opponents of Jefferson described him. I mean, to vote for Jefferson was really to, to vote against God. And, and you, would just, you would just be, if you haven't seen the kind of rhetoric they use, you'd be surprised by how vicious these you know, men in wigs could be. And so I guess like, my question is, in some ways, this is endemic to politics, right? That, that, that people sort of spin the truth, at least, or are trying to shape public opinion, particularly in a democracy. So is there something distinctive or new about the era we're living in that's, that makes it different and more, perhaps more dangerous, or perhaps it's just more of the same? Um, I, I think that there are certainly, you know, misinformation and kind of spinning have been part of American politics forever. I think that um, th the difference today is, is one, the level of, of partisanship um, in the country, at least by some metrics, we're more polarized than we've ever been before. That's both true as a public and it's uh, true in terms of Congress. Congress is more divided. Um, than perhaps it's ever been. And so I think people um, in that type of environment are ready to kind of attach themselves to any information which confirms um, their own um, predispositions. And so I think that is new. I think the, the amount of information that you can latch onto is, is also new. So as, um, as, as new media and um, the internet have um, exploded. I think that there are there are sort of more conspiracy theories, more misinformation that is spreading, and it becomes even more difficult to um, to get control of that, if not entirely impossible. So it is no longer just a couple main sources of information. That if you were to really step in and correct the type of conversation that's occurring there, you could perhaps improve political discourse. Now I think that it's next to impossible to do that. I, w I would echo that to, to, a, to a great extent and, and acknowledge the, the variety of news sources that are available to e each and every one of us at, at the drop of a hat. But I think I'm, I'm going to focus on something else about it as well, and that is a lot of the misinformation is particularly targeted. Um, and I'm not as convinced that that was the case before 1840. It was sort of a general media that went out to anybody who was willing to take a look at it. But these days on social media, you are more than likely uh, a target from someone in terms of the information that they are sending at you. Now, some of those targets you might think of as relatively innocuous in terms of the ads that show up in your social media feed. And I don't just mean your social media feed. I mean, if you're looking on a computer at a newspaper, the ads that show up are targeted toward you based on things you've searched for in the past, based on your age, based on where you live, based on other aspects of your demographic. And so you look at them and you wonder, who is listening to my cell phone conversations to know that I once talked about potentially buying a new vehicle? Um, and so that you look at those sorts of things and you should think not only are those sorts of things targeted at you, but all of the political information is particularly targeted just at you, oftentimes, slightly differently than someone else. And because of this, there are actors with, um, oh, I won't bother to be polite here, nefarious goals in mind here, um, that they are trying to convince you of something oftentimes. And interestingly, it's not just a spread of misinformation, incorrect information, trying to get you biased in one way or another, but a lot of it, I think, right now goes deeply toward disinformation. 
And I want to make a note about the distinction here. Misinformation is giving you a false piece of information about one particular point. Disinformation is, is really just spewing out a lot of information, some of which is too, true but irrelevant, some of which is demonstratively false, with the idea of having people just throw up their hands and say, it's hopeless. And there was an interesting article in the New York Times over the weekend on just that point that a lot of people, when they're looking at things like impeachment or other things, are all just like, yeah, I, I don't have any idea what's going on. It's really hard to figure it out. There's just too much information. They're all worthless. And so that, and probably some of you who have had that response. <laughs> you know, if we took a show of hands, we've all felt that way. And so I think that, that the, the targeting feels demonstratively different to me than what we've seen in other eras. And this is a reflection of uh, what can happen with social media and other forms of media through the internet age. Thank you. So one of the things, Michael, you said that, that kind of frightens me, because I've also had that feeling that I was described that, you know, when the House voted to start the impeachment hearings and you had such a partisan divide, you start to ask yourself, is it, I mean, is it really possible that I'm living in a bubble and, and that I'm misinformed or disinformed? How do I know which one I am? Um, or am I the sort of, if I can't trust reason anymore, thanks to you, but, you know, <laughs> but if I could, um, am I the reasonable one? Um, and, and that starts to undermine sort of my sense that I can trust what I'm seeing or that I even could trust my own inclinations. And you said, which I thought was kind of frightening, is there's nothing anyone could do about it. What did you mean by that? Like, <laughs> because that's, you know, that's stressful. Well, so when I say that there's nothing you can do about it, I mean that, you know, the, the government is not going to be able to step in and stop the spread of misinformation or disinformation. If anything, you know, you, you shut down one platform, it will exist somewhere else that you can't, you can't stop it from spreading. There are things that we individually can do to kind of protect ourselves against misinformation or disinformation. I, I don't have a, a great number of tools. There are probably some folks who, uh, who have some better ideas than I do. Uh, the thing that I tell students who ask me um, that same question is, um, if it sounds too good to be true, then you might want to look into that a little bit more. So, you know, if you are not a Trump fan and you see a story on Facebook that says he stole all the money from Fort Knox and he gave it to Putin, then you might want to uh, to say, you know, like before sharing that with your entire family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you might want to say like, uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my due diligence here, and, and let's kind of check a variety of sources that have you know, a better reputation um, than, than my Facebook page. Well, okay, so let's say I do that, yeah. right? Let's say I, I get the story and it's too good to be true, and so my biases are being confirmed. It's proof that everything I thought about, about the other side is actually really true. Um, so I start to do more research, and I'm, you know, I'm moderately well educated, and so, so I start to go in and think. I think something you said to me once was, actually, my education is itself a problem here. Right. So, <laughs> if anything, your education <laughs> makes it worse. Um, Pink Floyd and, said that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of it's kind of a weird thing to be a college professor and warning you about education, but because um, I'm a real proponent of it. But but the. The fact of the matter is that if you go searching for information, you can generally find information as you start to scan through the list of things on your Google search that lead you to want to click on those. And the ones that you choose to click on might be different than the ones I would choose to click on or the ones that Johan would choose to click on or Michael would click on. And so that we are all of us able to find information that will be consistent with the thing that we, we kind of liked. And all of this assumes that we're going to engage in that sort of critical evaluation. Um, when honestly, I, I know how I scan my social media feed. So when I'm, when, when I'm reading the New York Times, I, you know, I, I generally trust the New York Times. But if I'm like sliding through Facebook or I'm sliding through Twitter or if I'm you know, looking at Instagram or whatever else the, the, my students are looking at, which I don't see, but I'm typically, I'm on Facebook because I want to see what my family is doing. I'm on Facebook because I want to see pictures of my former students with their new kids. Um, or announcements about jobs and this sort of stuff. And so I'm just like sliding through this material to see what my friends and family are doing. And then there are the things that they repost. 
and there are the target ads that, that show up for me. And the, the thing of it is, if you see it once, you're probably going to see it 10 or 20 times. And as you repeat it, it makes you more likely to start to think it's going to be true. Um, and it becomes more easy for you to believe that it's true. There's a, 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 it's called an illusory truth effect in our field, that every time we repeat something, it makes people more likely to believe it. Do you believe me on that yet? I've said it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's one of these sort of nefarious things. So you're not generally critical, but when you do get critical, your education trains you how to find information and find information that's consistent, and you can prove almost anything you want to right now by playing around the Internet then I have no solutions. <laughs> well, I think our time is done. Yeah. <laughs> so if you do have a solution, though, the, the, the solution is to slow down. Mm -hmm. um, when we just do things quickly and easily, we do tend to just accept information and, and go, on, go forward with it. And we might just quickly click share because that meme looked really cute that had a cat. Um, but the advice is to slow down and to maybe not immediately share to decide thoughtfully whether or not you want to share. Doing the research might help, you know, and there are websites for fact checking that most of which are reliable, but, you know, you, slowing down is like the safest thing you can do to, before you share something, um, is make a decision about, thoughtful decision about whether or not you want to share. So what happens when we slow down? Like, what does that mean cognitively? Like, why does that, why is that a strategy? Well, I mean, a lot of cognitive psychologists pointed a distinction between two real fundamentally different types of thinking. Fast thinking, which are much more uh, based on heuristics, which are quick tools, rules of thumb for making judgments. They're also guided by our biases. I hate or I love Trump. Um, and so those sorts of things, when we do them quickly, we're not thinking deeply. We're just going with the quick, available response, which is oftentimes emotionally driven. When we slow down, we tend to engage better thinking and that slowing down makes us less likely, I think, to jump on things. Um, and so that those sorts of things can help. I think there's a limit as to what we can expect people to, to do critical thinking wise. And so we're gonna need more solutions than just slowing down. Uh, but there's actually some compelling evidence recently that when you do have people slow down, they're less likely to share false information. Um, they do a better job of it. This is since I even saw you in the spring when we talked about this, there's new data out on this. It's cool. That is quite cool. That's great. <laughs> So one of the things, if you ever write in any kind of venue um, that we're told early on is don't read the comments. So if I were to go and pick something to study, it would not immediately be the comments. Yeah. Um, but that's where you went. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, just sort of building on what I said, like when I read the comments on any controversial topic, I feel like, one, I'm looking for my friends in the comments, you know, the, not, not necessarily people I know, but the people who are going to say the things I once said. Yeah. But I feel like they kind of get harder and, 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 and more rigid over time. Mm -hmm. And so does actually the experience of like, like you know, I, I used to believe and want to believe and hope to believe again that, you know, that democracy depends on open-minded, reasonable people working together to make decisions and all that kind of stuff. But, but then when I'm in this space, is, there the, is it hardening and reinforcing what I think? Or is, it, is there, because there's disagreement and conflict, is it actually an opening, a moment for me to actually sort of do that kind of civic work and civic thinking? Yeah, it, it, I, think it, I think it depends on how you approach that. There, there, are, there are more thoughtful spaces for online conversation than, than other spaces. Uh, toward the bottom of a comment section is not a place where you would find um, particularly, you know, reasonable um, discussion. And, and my, my interest in this sort of stemmed from, you know, I saw that people, uh, I, I was doing some work in graduate school and just some basic survey research and found that people that were using the internet to get their news thought more negatively about politics, political leaders, institutions, um, compared to people that were you're getting their news from more traditional sources. And so then you start to think, well, what is different? Like the same article is published in the Washington Post online as is published in the newspaper. And so, um, you know, what, what makes internet news different? And I was thinking about some of these interactive components like comment sections and perhaps exposure to things like that, breeding um, that, that negativity. Um, and so, um, you know, my, my interest really kind of lied there. So I think that, you know, one of the things that it seems to do is kind of spark 
anger as people are, are reading the comment sections. Um, and a little bit of uh, skepticism about the news itself. So um, in some of my work, I was you know kind of demonstrating that people had, it changed people's perception of the information which they initially read. So if you were reading the comment section of an article on you know the, the Washington Post website, then you might have uh, you know a different impression of the content of that article than um, than somebody who did not read that comment section. And so I think that is um, that is a really interesting piece. These conversations that we have online can shape our perceptions of the news. That's really interesting. I mean, it seems to me almost like um, if we read the paper, um, and some of us remember when we read the paper, um, and then we'd go to work and mm -hmm. we'd be done for hours thinking, yeah. we'd just be thinking about that article and that's kind of slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it may be that reading the comments and sort of getting involved or, or following the next article out, we never, we, that's fast. Yeah. And so it immediately prevents the kind of processing that you're talking about or I don't know, but. Yeah, yeah I think it does. I mean, even when we were eating lunch, the three of us, we were talking about, uh, there's these impeachment hearings going on. I don't know if, <laughs> if you, <laughs> but it's the sort of the, the speed with which we expect evaluations of those things too. That we're not only trying to follow that, but we're looking to see what the commentators are saying. So, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter for a variety of reasons. Some of them related to my academic work, which is where I can stay in touch with some of my colleagues. And, and Twitter works really fast in terms of promoting responses to these sorts of things, not all of them thoughtful. And, and I think... <laughs> I think that it's a it's a reflection of the sort of the speed at which we expect everyone to respond to everything all the time, and uh, I'm I'm actually not convinced that's healthy for democracy. Um, it's definitely not help, healthy for your cognitive approach to these sorts of things, or I think your emotional approach to these sorts of things because you're you're constantly on edge of, of dealing with these sorts of things. Um, so that it, it's it's really kind of tricky, the, the speed with which the things fly through the internet. And for my colleagues who study the spread of the, the misinformation on, on the internet, it's, it's astonishing how quickly the things get picked up from one place to another to another. And they're spread by, by bots, little computer programs that further spread these things. And then they may be picked up you know, by one weird conspiracy note who said something, and then it's spread a little more widely. And before too long, it's on Fox News. Um, or some other, you, you, I'm not joking when I note that news source because it tends to be a place, not the news channel itself, but the opinion pieces there, tends to be a place where uh, conspiracy from the internet moves relatively rapidly. Uh, so that it, it is a place that furthers the spread of misinformation more frequently than most other of the sort of mainstream type news sources. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's definitely fair, and um, <laughs> I think that that is that is one of the problems that we're facing too. I think that you know it would be one thing if you know sort of misinformation, disinformation was being spread just in these kind of obscure online spaces, but when they're given a voice both from political leaders and from those on television, I think that makes it you know I mean that does make it impossible to stop the spread of, of, of that kind of dangerous information. So, we live in a democracy. Um, or, you know, <laughs> and um, our aspiration is to live in a democracy. And, and we have been working our way there and we have had highs and lows, but that is, you know, that's a principle of, of the world we, of the nation we inhabit. Um, and that requires citizens to do certain things like vote. Yeah. And it requires, hopefully, citizens to do things like vote because they're informed. And, <laughs> um, and I guess so, like with these bots or you know, these, these sort of discussions about how foreign governments are, have hired people to, to, I mean, across the political spectrum just to spur both distrust in our institutions distrust in ourselves, but also to spur anger and to, to reinforce kind of sub-community loyalties that are often hostile to other communities. Um, 
do they rely on us? I mean, like, like is, are we kind of unknowing because we are just sort of participating in it? Like, are we, are we kind of like, is there kind of a popular part where we all are playing our role in spreading myths or disinformation? Or? To a great extent, yes. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, when I noted that, that we're all targets, I mean, we're, we're targets of the, the ads, but we're targets of this political misinformation and disinformation as well, some of it from uh, foreign sources, some of it from conspiracy theorists, some of it from both left-wing and right-wing extremists that, that were all targets. And so you can, you can find that there are these agents out there, some of whom have actually their own financial reasons for doing it, so that the, the arguments against uh, climate change really boil down to financial uh, motivations for many of the people arguing against it. Um, but it, it's not just that it, it starts in, in these one, one or two places, but there's this, this thing that used to be true when people talk about the Soviet Union, and, and it's still, I mean, that's who we're talking about here to some extent. Unwitting agents is what they call those of us on the internet who share a bit of misinformation or disinformation. So my, my friend Kate Starbro down at the University of Washington who follows the spread of misinformation through uh, the internet uh, calls those of us who, who click to share something that's incorrect unwitting agents of uh, the spread of this misinformation. And a lot of it happens that way. It, it shows up in one or two places. You happen to follow somebody or see it on a bot, and you're like, oh, that's cool. Click share, and you know, suddenly it, it's, it gets lifted up further. And then you know, it's like even last week, um, C Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who testified in the impeachment hearing, uh, his family moved here when he was a child. They immigrated. And there were people accusing him of being a traitor, uh, of, of being a sellout in some fashion or another. And so it started with one or two rumors that got picked up by one or two other places and one or two really obscure media places. But before too long, it's in Donald Trump Jr.'s Twitter feed. And then it's on Rush Limbaugh. And then it's on Fox News. And so you can follow these bits of information. It usually requires not just the spread from these people who have their own goals, but it, it follows because of many of us as well being unwitting agents and helping to share this misinformation. Yeah, you know, there's, there's uh, I think going back to that education piece as well is, is really important. So um, there's this, you know, uh, academic uh, Marcus Pryor who did some research and he said, you know, basically the rise of the internet means that um, we've kind of divided along different groups. So there are those who have used the increase in information to become like more knowledgeable about politics and those who have just tuned it out entirely. Like if you don't want to pay attention to politics, you really don't have to. You could just watch cat videos on the internet all day and yeah, maybe you're better off for it. But um, of those then who are more educated, um, they also are the most partisan. Right, so what you have is, um, you know, peop the people who are paying attention to politics are incredibly partisan, and those are the people that are more likely to latch on to something that confirms their existing perspective. And so, um, you know, that I think that's, you know, that that's really the piece. It is not that you know people are just not smart and they're being taken advantage of. It's because they're so smart and they care so much that um, it makes them, uh, you know, more willing targets. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> it, is well, a, it is depressing. <laughs> it is depressing. Um, so if that's the case, like, I mean, so the sort of default American answer that, that we need more education, or we need better education, or we need, I mean, do we need different education? Um, I mean, what is, what, is, what is it that we can do to prepare, not just ourselves, but really in the next generation, to live in this world where the, with a different set of media technologies than we had before? I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really quick, what can we do yeah. to save the world? So yeah, please. <laughs> I'm gonna take notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in my field there are people desperately trying to find ways to make us less likely to spread misinformation um, and more, more able to be critical thinkers. And there's been a couple of suggestions uh, that I've seen literally just showing up in journals in my field in the last month uh, for what, we are, what we're now calling inoculation studies. Um, I mean, I'm hoping that you all got your flu vaccine. <laughs> 
And the, yeah, me too. Um, and the, the hope is that we can do something similar with misinformation in the media and social media by training people exactly what to look for by training people that this is what it's going to appear like and this is why it's going to be so appealing when it shows up. And so I actually gave an assignment to my uh, students in my large lecture classes last week based on these inoculation studies where I say, okay, I want you to go find a bit of misinformation and I not just find a bit of misinformation and show why it's wrong, but I sent them to think about several aspects of that misinformation. Who was the target? Who was that misinformation aimed at? And where was the original source? And who was benefited by this misinformation? And so I think that, that some of these ideas about misinformation and, and inoculating people is training people not to just think critically about the, the, the idea itself, mm -hmm. but to training them to think critically about the people behind the idea. Um, to realize that everything that shows up on the internet, with the exception of cat videos, that there's someone you know who's specifically targeting to get you to do something, like adopt a cat. Uh, <laughs> but but that, there's, that there's a purpose there and, and teaching people to start to watch for that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, I think there's limited effectiveness of this because it requires still that critical thinking part, but there's hope at least that maybe some of this stuff might be effective. I, I think I'll look into that. So, yeah, I'll hope in general. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, hope. <laughs> I feel like we should, we should offer a little more. Um, mm -hmm. So, as we're heading into this election, what are those kinds of things we should be looking for? What are the kinds of things that you know we're we're in a we're in a hyperpartisan moment um, that um, polarization has increased across the board, but as you say, particularly among the politically engaged. Mm -hmm. um, that, nece that wasn't necessarily true before, where polarization seemed to be among the elites, but not seeping down to, to the electorate at large, but now we seem to think, see that polarization is actually increasing across the board. Um, so we're all kind of wanting our side to win. I mean, and that seems like something we're not, that we can't just take away. So what should we be looking for as we go into this election, both in terms of what we might see as the other side's misinformation, but perhaps more importantly, when we know that we might be ourselves either unwitting agents of sharing misinformation or caught up in things and not knowing what's real about, about an issue. <laughs> Aren't these the kind of questions you expected? <laughs> yeah, but I didn't come with an answer. That's yeah, th there's not there's not a there's not a great answer. I really like the idea of the inoculation studies. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And in order to solve a problem, you have to recognize what the problem itself is. So maybe you know reflecting on um, the ways in which perhaps you have been. Um, convinced of something which later on turned out not to be true to kind of understand where your own vulnerabilities lie um, to understand what your inclinations are in terms of you know what are you more likely to believe um, online uh, you know do you tend to believe anything negative about this candidate or that candidate and if so maybe kind of identify you know why that is and build um, build up a kind of resistance to that that uh, but but you know, I, I'm not I'm not sure that you know large scale I have I have a great answer. I think that there there are ways that we can kind of reflect about the way that we consume information that might be helpful. But I don't know that there's like a systematic way to solve this problem more generally. So I I do think that the inoculation type studies and training people to be, people to be better at recognizing these sorts of things shows some promise. But but uh, I worry it's. Um, my, my hope there depends on each and every one of us doing better. And I think that, that that's hard when we're all targeted so constantly. And so if, if I really am searching for solutions, and I am uh, searching for solutions, I, I don't want to put it on each and every one of you. I want some of those actors who really hold responsibility for pushing this misinformation to actually take responsibility for their actions. Um, and so I, I would love to see us go back to a, a stronger sense of journalistic ethics, 
Um, and <laughs> hey, <what's that? laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of a radical idea that uh, that you should, <laughs> if you, if you're a journalist of any sort, and that's also an opinion journalist, that you have some responsibility for basing the things you say on accurate information. And when you make an error, own the error and take responsibility for it. Um, and this is lacking in many places on the media, which apparently are not sure if they're journalists or entertainers. Um, and I mean, you can look at you know the, the extreme places like Alex Jones, who just pushes conspiracy theories. And please, if you don't know who he is, don't go look him up. Yeah, that's <laughs> that is excellent oh, advice. Yeah. Do not do that. Yeah. But but I mean, it also plays with with uh, Facebook's approach of not wanting to worry about the accuracy of information that shows up in political ads. And I would be less concerned if those ads weren't directly targeted and limited in who they were aimed at. Because then if everybody in the community saw the ad, there could be some discussion about it and more open discussion about it and some transparency. But if you are one of the you know few people in the community that sees it, then it's hard for you to get uh, a counter view. And so that, that there's a, a failure, I think, on a lot of the media companies. And I, I go broadly here for everything from you know, the MSNBC and Fox to Facebook to Twitter to uh, the, the true nether regions of the internet to take responsibility for being, uh, for, for holding to some level of journalistic ethics. So that I, I, I don't want to put it all on you personally because I think a lot of it has to do with the people doing the target interview. I think it's really hard, you know, it, 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 you know, for the media to do that, it would, it would need to be all of them kind of taking on that responsibility. I think one of the problematic things I see today is that the comp, you know, like, so um, I think that some media companies are really good when, you know, you identify that there is, is something incorrect in a story, it, you know, kind of getting out in front of that and saying, you know, we messed up, but an environment where everything is being labeled you know, as fake news, that becomes an example of how, you know, kind of mainstream journalism is corrupt. And then you never have corrections from some, some segments, and so they never go through that sort of, you know, public backlash or atoning for a, a mistake. And so I think that there's some sense unless all of journal, you know, all of the sort of media outlets do it, that it can create, you know, a, you know further distrust of, of mainstream news sources. And so I, 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 I want to. I, I, I do want to be hopeful, yeah. though, that there's there's a solution, and I look for ways to be hopeful. But I'm just, um, I'm as is uh, is is kind of pessimistic on this as I am about anything in American politics right now. We had hope <laughs> when we ended last time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think you know one of. <laughs> it's okay. You're it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. I'm, I'm. I like to be optimistic, but um, I, I do think one of the things that you know, just to just to go further on this point about responsibility and journalistic ethics, it is worth remembering that part of this is also policy. That when we started deregulating the media in the 1980s, the idea was with the emergence of cable. You no longer needed this sort of fair and balanced rules. And then the internet, the Silicon Valley folks just took this to an extreme and said, since anything can go on the internet. But part of the mistake was that we conflated choice and a kind of consumption model of news with journalism, which is perhaps not that. But policy played a role in that. And so we should remember that it's not just responsibility on the part of some companies, but there, there is a role for policy making that could shape some of these things. But I guess I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, building on that, if we're all seeing different ads and we're all seeing different things, and there's also some evidence that, you know, we all, our, our neighborhoods have long been segregated. You mean segregated by race, certainly segregated by economics, but increasingly, there's a way people have suggested that we're being segregated by our broader politics. And you know, you can drive through a neighborhood and almost guess the the politics of the neighborhood are the lawns nicely manicured, or there are a lot of Priuses, and, um, and you kind of know, you know, and, and that wasn't always the case, you know, and, um, and so if we're, you know, is, is part of this this broader fragmentation that's happening not just on the internet, but throughout our communities, 
And does exposure to other kinds of people, does that, I mean, does that play a role in making us less likely to be misinformed or more open to thinking through more slowly the ideas we have or not? I don't know. I mean, there's, there's compelling evidence in, in some domains, exposure to different sorts of people makes us much more open to those different sorts of people. Um, it's it's a, sort of our classic way of uh, addressing problems of racism and stereotypes is to have greater exposure to a greater variety of people. Um, you're more likely to find racism and stereotypes in very uh, homogenous neighborhoods. Um, in much more mixed neighborhoods, you see less evidence of that. You see much more inclusivity uh, happening in, the, in those sort of contexts. You could imagine the same sort of thing in a political sphere, that it's easy to denigrate the other side when you don't have much contact. And when your only contact is through watching what you see in the news media. Um, and since all of you are here at the Bellingham City Club, and Bellingham is this weird liberal enclave, um, you know, I, I don't, you, you can't assume that. But you know, I, I think that that it does. We are seeing that sort of moving to places based on whether or not you feel comfortable. Um, and there is there. I don't know. You must have seen some of the the stories as well. And I'm assuming you have as well. That that people no longer uh, would feel good if their child married a person from the other political party. Um, that that we really are seeing this sort of, and some of you are laughing, you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> Don't you go doing that. <laughs> and and we, we, we see this sort of evidence that, that it's that we no longer is confident that each other is uh, playing fairly with information. Um, and so it, 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 that sense of distrust, I think, but it's promulgated by, again, some of this targeted stuff that's aimed at you. Yeah, I think that um, you know, while, while I think that, you know, I, I'm kind of pessimistic about stopping the spread of misinformation or disinformation, I, I am at least optimistic about our potential to engage with people who are different than us, that believe different things than us. I think that we interact in those environments much differently than we do in online spaces. I think that, um, you know, I don't know if you have the same experience, but I certainly do, of going online and seeing people that... I have interacted with in very polite and friendly ways in person, say the most horrific things to other folks online. And so there is something about um, communicating to somebody um, online that is, uh, that is very impersonal. And I think that that kind of sometimes brings out the, the worst um, in us. And I, I think that um, when we do, when that is the way we engage with people and as we retreat from um, from interacting with folks who are different than us in, in, in person, I think that that causes, you know, really problematic things to occur. And so that can be one challenge that you, you know, kind of give to yourself is to um, intentionally find ways that you can interact with people who might believe something different than you do. So I'd, I'd like to just follow up, up on, on that point about your internet trolls. Mm -hmm. um, because anonymity does lead toward more aggressive behavior from people. When you feel more anonymous, you're more likely to uh, aggress toward other people. And it's really stupid things where you're actually not anonymous. Wearing uh, tinted sunglasses where people can't see your eyes makes you be more likely to be aggressive in situations. I mean, it's, it, psychologists have done these sorts of experiments. And, it's, and, yeah. and so when you are on the internet and your tag is not identified as you, um, it's much easier to say mean and aggressive and hateful things than if you actually have to own it and say it to your face, yeah. um, where it's a, it's a very different sort of thing. And so there are times that I think one of the, I have really mixed feelings these days about anonymity just for this. I can see places where it's important, and I can also see that in the comments sections, you probably should not be allowed to be anonymous. Um, that you probably should be identified and people should know where you are. Um, and. Yeah. And and I, I and you're like, oh no, I don't want them coming to my house. But if you don't want them coming to your house, then don't say those hateful things. You know, I mean, it's a it's a really weird thing. That, and I'm I'm not sure where I personally fall on this right now, but I know that anonymity is part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. There, there's something very good about uh, you know our desire to be you know kind of. So, yeah, to be accepted socially, <laughs> and yeah. uh, the internet <laughs> removes that and um, kind of um, reduces us sometimes to our worst impulses. And so, 
um, I think uh, you know, forums like this where we are having uh, conversations uh, can be really helpful. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you say what? Uh, but, um, but what about places like I think the the phenomenon you're describing happens even in non-anonymous contexts like mm -hmm. Facebook, right? Yeah. And where, yeah. where I mean, I don't know if like when I go on Facebook, maybe I'm just you know the only lonely person in the world and I want affirmation, but but you know, and then somebody says, "Oh no, Johan, you're totally wrong about that." In two lines. I go like, I get so upset. Like, why, <laughs> why am I wrong? And why does this person want to say this on my Facebook feed? Well, because they're my friend on Facebook. You know, I mean, they're. I'm sorry, I did that to you. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, this is not all just about us. And but but the question then is, is it like what what is the medium having to do with it? Like, is it is it something about because you said like what is the cause effect? Is it that being in an online setting puts us in places where we're more likely to use information differently, um, to want different things from the information we're using, or is it something outside of our internet world that is shaping what we're doing online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, there's some ways in which um, I think that there is being, you know, kind of interacting with somebody in person is very different than interacting with them online. And you know, I love having you know debates online with with close friends and going back and forth on. Something. I mean, there's there's something that's kind of kind of fun about that. And you know, those conversations look very much like they would if we were having those conversations in person with each other. Um, but you know, um, there are times where you might post something that is that is really personal to you. People, you know, as partisanship increases. Is people's you know political beliefs are very important to them personally, and when they share something about politics online, um, and those around them start critiquing that, um, it becomes becomes hurtful, right? And it's taken as a personal offense, and so the response can be kind of similarly personal um, at times. And you know, it, if it starts there, it ends in a much worse spot usually. Sort of. To follow up on, on that, I think that there's, there's a couple of aspects about what happens online. One, you automatically feel anonymous when you're just staring at your phone or you're mm -hmm. staring at a computer screen compared to interacting with the person straight up. So even though I know that it's Johan on the other end of this exchange, he's not there and I'm not talking to him at that moment. And so it, it, it's not as though I'm insulting him to his face at that moment. And so it, it feels more anonymous, even in that second when I'm responding to somebody who I know. But the flip side of that is how much information we lose in a conversation every time we step away from face to face. Face to face, we get a lot of information about the other person's responses. I can read your eyes. I can read your body language to know that I've said something that's put you off a little bit. I still get a good bit of that information, but not as much if we're, uh, say, on a video chat. Uh, because our eyes are not actually looking at each other, and so it gets a little bit off because we're looking at the screen and not at the camera. It gets weird. Um, it gets a step worse when we're doing a, a phone conversation, and cell phones are worse because there are weird lags in cell phone conversations that make it hard to understand and to pick up on what the other person is experiencing. You're most likely to have a, a disruption in a conversation and a failure to understand the other person when you're sharing text messages back and forth. Um, it's sarcasm just does not play on text, folks, even if you shrug your shoulders. <laughs> yeah, um, lesson learned there. <laughs> so, you know, it's, and it's because of, as, as a cognitive psychologist, you know, the communication side of this, the more information in those channels is available when we're doing it face-to-face, -face, there's so much less information when we're down at the level of text that, it's, that it may not have been intended that way, but it may have been perceived that way. And so you've got this sort of double whammy on these things. It both feels anonymous, and so you say things in an aggressive way, and it may be misperceived as what your intentions were. Yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, I don't, I don't know the data on this, but my hunch is that more and more of us are spending more and more of our time on the internet um, each day. And, um, and if you, what you're suggesting is that there's, there's, there's evidence to suggest that we are different with each other when we can look each other in the eye, when we can experience each other in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, and if, is the internet taking time away? You know, they had the, the same conversation and still do about television, like, and community and civic community. Is the internet 
not only the dangers of the internet, particular compared to TV or radio, but is it also filling space that might have been used differently where not just we would have different information, but we would have time to engage with our information with people in a different way? Like, is that part of what's happening? And is that part of what's feeding the kind of environment we're in? I, I, I think so in part. Like, we, um, I, I think that um, certainly, you know, there's uh, the sort of, you know, bowling alone arguments that only get, um, you know, kind of um, exacerbated by the rise of the internet. That book was about televisions and, you know, sort of, um, you know, people kind of retreating into their own homes and not joining community organizations such as this one and not interacting with, with folks around them in the way that they once did. And I think that that is, um, I think that's even worse with um, the internet is, is we have more and more options to retreat into our own sort of personal enclaves. I think that that um, does reduce, you know, it, it serves, it, it's a disservice to us personally, um, as well as it's kind of disruptive to the community. It, it leads to a real difficulty in starting strong um, community um, organizations where people work together, um, even people who have different beliefs work together to solve common problems in the community. I think that there is, there's something really lost in that. So I'm gonna go the other way, the kids are all right. Um, I, I love my cell phone, my students at the university love their cell phone, they love the internet, I love the internet, and I actually think that there are communities that they are building through the internet and through their cell phones that uh, are, are different from and yet incredibly important, particularly for any of our students who uh, may feel somewhat socially isolated in the context that they're in, uh, they can find an affinity group on the internet and that's really useful. Um, and I love having all of the knowledge and all of the incorrect knowledge of the world available at any given time in my pocket. Um, and as an academic, I interact with people pretty much everywhere in the world on a day-to-day -day basis through the internet in a way that was not possible when I was a brand new assistant professor 30 years ago. And so it's, it's really opened up a set of interactions and a set of communities that I think were impossible to find when we were restricted geographically to just the people near us. And so for a variety of reasons, I am a real fan of the internet. I am a real fan of all the information. I'm a real fan of social media. And yet I recognize the, the risks involved, uh, and particularly the spread of misinformation that's involved, and the risk of being in a bubble where we uh, see the world one way and, uh, and are not able to see it from other ways. So it's a, it, with any technological advance, it brings us great opportunities, and it has some risks attached to it. And I think that the trick is always balancing those things. All right. Before we move to questions, yeah. um, so I think one of you know one of the challenges is there are, there are tools, perhaps as individuals, we can use or disciplines we can impose on ourselves in our engagement with information that may make it more likely that we would not spread or start to believe things that might be mis or disinformation. But, you know, we're gonna have an election, and <laughs> what, I mean, what do you anticipate happening now? I mean, what do you anticipate, hap what, is, what is the next election cycle gonna look like? How are we, how are we gonna experience it? And what do you, you know, in a more collective sense, what is, what's in store for us? Well, uh, I... <laughs> and also hope. <laughs> You want hope? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll attach the hope piece to the to to the end of this. I think. I mean, I you know, if I was to predict, which after the 2016 election, I said I would not do anymore. But I, um, if I was to predict here, I think things, I, I think things will not be good. I think that right now you have, um, I mean, certainly misinformation, disinformation. I think are you know kind of a. They're, they're going to be a part of, you know, social media, of, of online news for, for as long as those things exist. You can't stop um, entirely that information from spreading. Um, and, and I think that right now, I mean, we have, we have a news organization, we have a president, and we have a political party that, you know, kind of propagate 
that misinformation, disinformation, those conspiracy theories. And I think that that makes it, you know, impossible to stop the spread of that information. There's going to be talk again about, you know, voter fraud, for example, as we get closer to the election, something that, you know, academics who have studied that issue say that, that just doesn't exist. Um, and those things become a rationale for instituting, you know, tough, uh, tough laws that, that prevent people from accessing the right to vote. Um, and, and so things like that will will continue to occur. Um, I, you know, while while I am pessimistic, I um, I try to end uh, end my courses by kind of giving at least some reason to to maintain optimism. And it's not based on anything that I you know can predict is going to happen. So um, I use this this quote from Cornell West who talks about the difference between optimism and hope. Um, and he talks about how optimism is based on, you know, kind of looking at the evidence and saying, based on the evidence, I think something really good is going to happen. Whereas hope is saying, I'm gonna choose to be hopeful, even though like <laughs> I can't imagine what that hopeful future is going to look like. That um, I am just going to choose to have a hopeful orientation to the world around me and you know he kind of describes himself as a prisoner of hope and that he's going to die a prisoner of hope and and so i choose to have that orientation to the world even though like from you know sort of an academic perspective um sometimes i have a hard way uh, i have a hard time figuring out how we navigate um some of the mess yeah I, i'm pessimistic about the next election um in terms of the spread of misinformation you it's going to be ugly um, and it's gonna be ugly from a variety of sides. And I, and I don't just mean the direct political actors, but I mean all of the other people who will be spreading information, whether it's the Russians spreading information or political action committee spreading misinformation or just individuals throwing conspiracy theories out there, they get picked up and promulgated. Um, I'm, I'm fully aware that it's gonna be an ugly year that we've got ahead of us. Um, and we should all just sort of like Buckle down and expect that to be the case. I'm actually long-term optimistic with good reason. <laughs> and I'm not just hopeful, but I'm yeah. legitimately optimistic. And the, the reason I'm legitimately optimistic is I, I really think the kids are all right. Um, I think that the, the younger generation, they're not going to cure these things, but they are much more invested in building their internet communities and not just dishing one another on the internet, they're much more convinced about the importance of being open and inclusive to a greater variety of people. I think that they are very concerned about the nature of problems that are, have long-term consequences. So that I, I'm optimistic in the long term that the kids are gonna do it well. Um, <laughs> yeah. You should, you should take that with a grain of salt, right? I'm a college professor. I love my students still. <laughs> Although sometimes college professors don't have that. And I think, at least at Western now, I think I can say, I mean, students want to know. They care. They're trying to understand. There is a, there is, it does give you some reasons to be optimistic. Um, and I think that's really important to remember. Um, let's open ourselves up to questions. I don't think I'm in charge. I think she is with the microphone. Good afternoon. My name is Stan. I'm a guest of Rod Burton and Sarah Hill. Just moved back to Bellingham after 35 years away. I want to say that I rely, I notice, on the London Economist as an editorial staff and writers who mean us well and who are not us. And I wonder whether you have looked into that kind of source as not a corrective, but just an alternative to the Hall of Mirrors or the echo chamber in politics. Well, I think for all of us, there's a sense in which we should not rely upon a single source of information. Um, there are more and less reliable sources of information, um, and there's, there's good, good reason to pay attention to some of those ratings. I'm not wild about any of the sets of ratings I've seen because they, uh, they assume a false equivalence between more conservative and more liberal uh, versions, which I, I don't think are well justified. But I think that the best advice I could give is, is if you're trying to, to worry about the health of your own 
uh, sources of information is give yourself as many varieties as possible. Although saying that, I know that I have definitely been careful about my social media feed of who's in there and who's not, and that you know I I do dump some people who offend me with great regularity. So it's it's tricky to balance those sorts of things. Yeah, I think that's good. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the three of you for your insightful comments. I think they're very helpful. At the beginning of this meeting, you may not have heard, but our president pointed out that the City Club was founded in large part to promote civil discourse. And within these hallowed halls, that's, that's fairly easy and comforting. Outside these halls, it's more difficult. I was wondering whether any of you had a suggestion as we, how we might carry out the notion of civil discourse with people outside these halls. I mean, I, I'll just start by saying one of the things I try to remind myself about myself in the morning is that I'm a person, and that means that I'm good, and when people tap into my goodness, I do good things, and I'm not good, and when people tap into my baser or more selfish or more impassioned motives, I do less good things, and that's probably true of the other people in the world as well. I mean, so that's a starting point, I think. Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, by and large, um, most people, you know, there, there are certainly examples of, like, family, you know, you know, like Thanksgiving dinners that go off the rails or something. But most people, you know, we, we've had to grow up, you know, around people that are, that are different than us. We know how to, we know how to have those, those conversations. We just often... Um, we choose not to do it. Um, it is easier and safer to surround ourselves with people that, that we agree with. And, and so I think that if, um, you know, when we interact with people, you know, kind of respecting our sort of common humanity, again, I think that that's, um, that's something that we all, we all have been taught to do our whole lives. We just don't do it as often as we should. I think I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, weirdly, here for a second. And that is, I, one, I do think it's important to take these approaches and recognize that everybody is human and probably has decent intentions at heart. And thus, when we interact with people who we may not agree with, it's crucial to listen carefully and to maybe echo back what you hear them saying to make sure that you understand it correctly. But as a psychologist, I know that we, we end up with a uh, false consensus effect fairly frequently where we falsely believe that many other people share our viewpoints. And the reason this happens is because we rarely encounter somebody who disagrees with us. And so in those uncomfortable moments at Thanksgiving when, you know, Uncle Joe says something that's just Uncle Joe, no one says to him, you know, Joe, you need to stop. Um, and here's why that's not okay. And so I think it's important to both listen, to respect the other person, but there's a sense in which I think all of us have an obligation as well to when someone has said something that we're fairly sure is offensive to someone or that might be based on misinformation, to at least question it politely, respectfully, with love in our hearts and all that sort of stuff, but to not allow them to think that you agree with them. That it's a, it's a critical thing if we want to have meaningful conversation and to avoid a, a sense of a false consensus for people for them to become aware that not everyone agrees. Yeah, and I'll just, you know, oh, sorry, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> I would say, too, you know, that I think um, I'm a believer in, um, in sort of civil dialogue, but we also have to be careful about the way that we use um, that term as well. That there's, um, there's a lot of conversation now about, you know, how um, it's really the group that has the most power that gets to decide what is civil and what is not. And then when somebody speaks out against that group, they're labeled as being, um, you know, not civil. They're being incivil. And so um, I, I think that um, just some reflection on that point is, is, helpful, um, is helpful as well. That um, we should use, the, the idea of civility should be to bring us, you know, to an equal level where we are having a, a good, strong conversation about ideas, but it should never be used to shut down conversation. Dr. Hyman, 
I am interested in your process in the classes. Louder, okay. Um, the process, the, <laughs> let me start over here. <laughs> Dr. Hyman, <laughs> I'm interested in the process by which you assign students a project to react to information, process the information. In the Seattle Times this morning was a lengthy article about the White House's announcement that the Obama administration and staff had left nasty grams and horrible <laughs> notes <laughs> and when they left the White House for the new president and his administration to find. How would you begin to suggest people process that, especially since the news article itself claimed that there was absolutely no evidence that this had actually happened? Yeah, it's. I mean, that's an interesting question, right? I'm gonna have to get back to you about whether or not my assignment to my students was effective, right? It just came in last Friday and I haven't graded everything yet. So I can get back to you about whether or not that, that's effective. But I also know that uh, for people in my field, we worry about how to uh, counteract misinformation. And there's, a, there's a, a bit of a risk here that you get sometimes a rebound effect that if somebody has a bad piece of information and you give them the counter argument to it, what it does is cue up the belief that they already had and they get to defending that belief and so they get more attached to it. And so the risk of an article like this one, which I, I didn't see the Seattle Times but I saw it someplace else, is that you both present the misinformation and then only afterwards do you briefly denote, and usually much later in the article, that it probably didn't happen. And so you, you lead with the fake, um, and you end up, and many people may not get to the, to the, to the disproving of it later on. And so I, I can't actually give you a good answer yet, um, because it's, a, it's an empirical question that we're trying to wrestle with about how to confront these incorrect beliefs about whether, you know, how, it looks like you have to give a lot more information than just saying that's wrong. Um, that it's gonna take a lot of information to counteract misinformation. Hi, um, so I was really pleased recently when Twitter announced that they wouldn't take political ads anymore. What I'd like to know is my pleasure at this well-founded, or is it just a meaningless gesture? <laughs> <laughs> well, the existentialist said that could be a question we could ask about everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I think yes and no is, is going to be the obvious answer here, right? I mean, Twitter admitted that they didn't really make a lot of money on political ads, and so refusing to, to run them, uh, you know, didn't cost them much, and it got them some goodwill. And so it does cut down on the amount of information that people are paying to send around on the internet. Their definition of what counts as political ad, though, is really kind of tricky here. Um, and so I think that the, the, the real meat is going to be there. But then the other part of it is that most of the information that shows up on Twitter is not showing up in ads. Um, it's showing up in tweets that somebody makes and then gets retweeted and retweeted and retweeted and then finally picked up by some of the big, you know, uh, spreaders of misinformation. So that the, the, the problem is, is deeper than just with uh, the, the political ads. Um, it would be lovely if Facebook would do the same since they are a bigger taker of money and definitely engaged in the targeting of those ads. That's where the real risk is, I think. Yeah, I think that, you know, while I think that, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a symbolically, I think, um, interesting thing for them to do, um, I don't know that the, the problem is really with, with the ads. Um, and um, there, there's not that much evidence that, you know, even ads on television where people see those ads more often, that those ads are particularly um, persuasive to people or, you know, kind of shape vote choice or things like that. And so much less so for those ads that appear on the internet that only appeal to a, a much smaller um, percentage of folks. And I would just reiterate that this is, these are policy questions. You know, at the end of the day, we've confronted these kinds of questions with media companies before about mm -hmm. how we, what kind of information is allowed to be bought and sold and in what terms and how should it be presented that do we want to rely on Twitter or Facebook to make these choices or are these choices that as a democratic country we have other institutions that are empowered to make them? 
<laughs> First of all, I want to thank the three of you for a very stimulating and important uh, discussion. Um, I also want to, uh, I, it's kind of a commentary slash editorial, but it's a question as well. But before I do that, I actually think that uh, this country needs to re-evaluate um, uh, libel laws and slander laws and to make people accountable on a financial basis for the things that they spread and say. That's not what my question is, but uh, the, uh, to, the question becomes then, how do we go about doing that in a way that makes the discourse, uh, which is important to have in, in, in a, it, we're not a democracy, by the way, we're a republic, but uh, our d democratic republic, uh, how, to, how to make that a more effective uh, communication tool. So my question really to the three of you is, how do we go about using financial stimulus to bring that uh, conversation in a more meaningful manner? Well, I don't know that there's a way to um, to to change the existing, you know, a, a approach to to regulating, you know, libel or slander. I also um, would would sort of I, I think that 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 might have some unintended consequences. That you could say that 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 might be, you know, kind of used against um, organizations that repeatedly, you know, engage in misinformation or disinformation or things like that. A lot of those, but it would also be used against, um, you know, you can imagine situations in which political candidates would sue smaller organizations. We already have trouble keeping small news organizations in business, and if the threat of, you know, repeated lawsuits would be kind of leverage against them then that might you know put even more of them um, out of out of business and so um, I worry to some extent about giving politicians even more sort of um, control over what the media can and cannot publish um, because you know the Politicians are not as concerned about the publishing of misinformation or disinformation as they are in whether they're you know being covered favorably yeah. And so, um, so I worry about unfavorable coverage leading to a, a backlash. Thank you. Um, I have a question. It relates to this inoculation concept, which I really like, um, which I think could really work. And I'm thinking about the calls I get saying my social security number may have oh, been, yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, and always you click, hang it up, but in the back of your mind you're thinking, well, did somebody? But I got another ad from somebody else pointing out this is a particular scam with just those words, which is great. I can see that inoculation helping me. Okay, my question really relates to Facebook and these ads that are targeted to specific groups. It seems to me, with all the ability that Facebook has to monitor every last thing in the world that we're doing or thinking at any time, it would be very possible for them to create a separate site in which any paid political ad would have to be posted along with who it was targeted to and what the financial interests are of that group. Do you think that would be a good idea? <laughs> So I'll, I'll take a shot at this because, um, yeah, but it's a very weak idea. And here's what I mean by that. Because it requires me to go look at those uh, and to make an effort to go find that information. And instead, I think we'd be better off if it showed up with the ad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so that it, it appeared with the ad as to exactly who paid for it and who those people are, not just the, the name that they incorporated under. Uh, and what their motivation is, and who's being targeted as well. Um, and yeah, I actually do deeply worry as well about those fake calls you get about your Social Security, because it's another form of misinformation. Um, and I'm just looking around this room, and I'll say that most of you are targets, not only of these political things, but of the phone calls that you just mentioned, and also targets of mail fraud with great regularity. Um, I mean, I, I have been responsible for my mom's uh, business affairs for, for a while now because of her declining health. And the, the fake mail things about bills that she may or may not owe are, um, uh, I'm, I, I can't come up with the right language to, to express just how uh, offended I am by it, by the, the people who are directly trying to take advantage of, of my mom. 
uh, and of you and of your parents and of everyone else out there. And, and there it's not just political misinformation, it's that there are people who see it as a business model to steal from little old ladies is, um, it's there, thank you, despicable, there's a good word. I was, only thing I was coming up with was curse words and I <laughs> felt like I shouldn't do that in this room. Um, but I mean, it's, and so when we talk about misinformation, it's much deeper than just the political stuff, right? There, there are all these sorts of things that we would hope that the Better Business Bureau or the feds in some fashion were going after these schmucks, um, yeah. <laughs> In the 1960s, some of us remember um, the name Marshall McLuhan. The medium in the, is the message. So I'm wondering if you know about him, because you're so young. <laughs> 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 and if you think he was ahead of his time. But then more importantly than that, I'm wondering what you think about um, young men and their tendency to pick up a gun and shoot, and your experience with students and young men and the media, does that have anything to do with it in our countries since gun violence is so bad here compared to other countries? So those are really two topics. Yeah, I guess as a psychologist, I'll start on this one, but... Um, uh, the medium is the message. Yeah, the, the medium becomes an interesting way and it changes everything, right? I mean, the internet has certainly changed the way that I do my day-to-day -day job, the way I interact with people day-to-day. -day. It opens up a new set of possibilities, opens up a new set of risks. Um, with respect to the gun violence, I, um, I'm, I'm just gonna have to be political in response to this one. There's almost no way, no way around it. Um, most countries have issues with people having mental health challenges. Most countries are dealing with uh, the spread of misinformation and of hate speech on the internet, and people are exposed to them. The United States has a particular problem with gun violence, um, well beyond what we see in most other uh, first world nations. Um, it seems pretty clear to me where, where the problem is the guns, uh, the easy access to them uh, that, that seems to be problematic there. Um, there. There are ways to address those things, but those are policy discussions to be had. Um, but I would, I do not ever, as a psychologist, I do not ever want to blame this on mental health problems. People with mental health issues are much more likely to be the victims of violence than the perpetrators of violence. Um, yeah. Yeah, a absolutely. I think that um, you know the the internet, social media; those are those are worldwide phenomenon. And so, um, if if you know it was the true cause of mass violence, then then we would see that occurring everywhere else. And so, there has to be you know a, a tool that allows um, this type of violence to occur, and we have that tool in greater numbers here than anywhere else. Well, we're out of time, so I just <laughs> want to say if the medium is the message, thank you all for participating in, in this medium right here, and thanks for having us. Just real quickly before we let you go, we do have three copies of We Are Puget Sound, which is just a small expression of our gratitude to all of you, Ira Hyman, Michael Artime, Johan Neem, thank you very, very much for being here. And to all of you, the year is almost over, so let's finish strong, and we'll see you in 2020. <laughs>